On July 21, 1993, Dr. Avraham Biran, an Israeli archaeologist, discovered a remarkable stone bearing an inscription written in ancient Aramaic. He had found the first reference outside the Bible to King David and a ruling dynasty, evidence of the House of David. Raise up a king, one of your own. Call him to lead us, establish his throne. I have chosen a shepherd after my heart. He Well, here we are at uh, David's Tower in Jerusalem on the edge of the old city, uh, telling the stories of King David, uh, his life and legacy. What a fascinating life he led. Very well chronicled in the Bible. Uh, for those who don't uh, believe the Bible and have thought David didn't exist, the uh, archaeological stone that was recently found that says House of David puts another one of those biblical objections to rest. It's pretty hazardous to doubt what the Bible says. We uh, read about him and studied his life as a shepherd boy and as a musician. At this point, he is King Saul's armor bearer and musician. A uh, very important position with the army since, of course, Saul is the king. And he is at battle with the Philistines. And David arrives and first sees Goliath of Gath, the giant, taunting the Israelites and asking them to send forward a champion to fight with him. The Philistines, of course, uh, in a sense, the ancient Palestinians, although there were no ancient Palestinians, but that is where they took the name from, Philistine, Palestine. Uh, archaeologist Bob Mullins has very well documented this famous battle, has, can tell us how it happened right from the location where it happened. According to 1 Samuel chapter 17, the stage is set for a battle between King Saul's army and the Philistines between the city of Soko to the east and the Philistine city of Uzeka to the west. Leaving Bethlehem in search of his brothers, David walked westward toward the battle scene. It is from this location that archeologist Bob Mullins brings us the story of the shepherd boy versus the giant, David and Goliath. Right now we are located in a region of Israel known as the foothills, the Shephelah. And this is in fact a buffer zone between the territory of the Philistines, which lies to the west. You can see again Telezeka to our west. And just on the other side is the territory of Philistia. Whereas the Israelites are located in the hill country over to our east, as well as Soko, the other site mentioned in 1 Samuel 17. Whenever there's a battle, you want that battle to take place not in your home territory, but in the buffer zone in between the two homelands. And that's the reason why the battle took place here. So let's go down to the valley now and see the location where this battle took place. Down from the hills that surround this valley, there is a stream bed, in Hebrew called a nachal. During the rainy season of the year, this kind of stream is full of water. The rest of the time, the stream bed is dry, and it may have been dry when David passed by. From here, Bob Mullins continues the story of the battle. The tactic in the Aegean world, and the Philistines in fact do come from the Aegean world, was to uh, send out champions, um, a representative of each army that would meet in the middle and fight a duel. And then after that, the battle would proceed. And so what has happened up to this point is that the Philistines, led by Goliath, have come out to the field here about midway where we are standing now, and in the direction of the Israelite camp have been shouting challenges to send out someone who will challenge Goliath in a battle. But of course, all the Israelites are very afraid because this man is over nine feet tall. We're told in Samuel that he wore a bronze helmet. He wore a mail of armor that weighed 125 pounds. Uh, his, his spearhead, just the tip of it weighed 15 pounds. So we're dealing with a massive person and also a professional warrior. So no one was wanting to come out from the Israelite ranks 
to challenge this fellow. That is until David comes on the scene. It's at this point that we want to take a look at our passage again in 1 Samuel chapter 17, where David challenges Goliath in this duel. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream bed, and you can see all around we have plenty of stones. He would have chosen a stone like this. This is a larger size projectile. Or maybe it would have been something more modest in size like this one. He put it into a shepherd's bag and then proceeds over to the other side to uh, meet Goliath uh, in his duel. We read that as the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. So what David would have done is reached into a shepherd's bag, pulled out one of the five stones, taken his sling, and this is an example of the kind of sling that David would have used. In fact, the way that you work it is there's a loop on one end. You put this around your little finger, and you grasp the other end and your thumb and forefinger, placing the stone in the leather pouch. Sometimes these pouches could be made of cloth as well. And then what he would do is use centrifugal force to build up speed and at the right moment release the stone striking Goliath in the forehead. And just to give you an idea how it would work, I will spin it. They would have spun it horizontally like this, building up more and more speed and right at the right moment then release it and hit Goliath on the forehead. We read that David triumph over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. And after he killed him, in other words, apparently the stone did enough damage to knock him out or put him near death, but the final um, item was to take his sword and killing him, he then cut off his head with the sword. And then we're told that when the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they ran off in the direction of their home country. Uh, just behind us, those mountains you see there, that is the homeland of the Israelites. The Philistines are in the other direction. So they would have run back this direction, back to Ekron, Gath, and other cities in Philistia to safety. Israel has always been small, but always so strong with the Lord. Uh, with him on their side, they have won many battles. Uh, they're mismatched today so badly against 22 Arab states. <laughs> you know, the media thinks that this one country of 4 million is Goliath against the Arab 22 countries of 200 million. Their ignorance of the subject is so overwhelming. But Israel is confident. And as with the young David, when he faced Goliath, uh, they feel with the Lord they will win. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 37 says this, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with thee. The Philistines of today, the 22 Arab nations and all of the Western media are Israel's enemies. And yet uh, they have won in every war. Outgunned, they have always survived. Uh, we're going now to talk with a Golan tank uh, commander who is a typical story of a wonderful battle when we come back. And I believe that this kind of feeling that uh, we are the, the new generation of David, uh, this is the feeling that we carry with us. I just love Israel. I love it. I love the people, and I like going on Zola's tour, too. I just love walking where Jesus walked and just living the Bible. It's amazing. It comes to life for you. This is the fifth time, remember, with Zola, <laughs> and it was marvelous, and it still is. Tour the Holy Land with Zola Levitt. Call or write for more information. Many battles in the history of modern Israel have happened near the road that goes from the Mediterranean coast up to Jerusalem. One such place has become a military museum called Latrun. 
It was here that our producer, Ken Berg, interviewed Avigdor Kahalani, a veteran of four wars who is currently serving as a member of the Israeli parliament. Well, I'm uh, I born in Israel and look my color. I understand that my parents immigrate from Yemen 70 years ago and uh, we are here. Um, I found myself, I uh, grew up in Israel and uh, my father uh, explained to me how he gave the, uh, the independence for the, our nation, you know. And he thought it's going to be quiet for 40 years, like it was written in the Bible, it's going to be quiet 40 years. And from 1948 we fought, I fought four times for this country. And I found myself again in 1973 fighting in, uh, in Golan Heights, like battalion commander. And this war was, uh, it was a very difficult war. It was, uh, the main problem it, it was uh, how to stop the Syrian from capturing Golan Heights. They already captured most of the Golan Heights. They, they captured half. Uh, from the south uh, with uh, maybe four or uh, five hundred tanks and they came from the north they captured the Hermon mountain we call it the eyes of the the nation we can we can watch we can observe Damascus from this area and they came from the north with another uh, 300 400 tanks to my area and uh, for four days we fought uh, again and again and again and uh, we had successful in this area and we stopped them. And how many tanks did you have? I understand there's a I discrepancy in size here. I, I start with around um, 40 tanks, but I lost most of them. The last battle, it's, we stopped them. We survived around uh, four or five tanks. Four or five tanks were taking yeah. on how many Syrian tanks? Um, in, in the area, the Valley of the Tears, we call the area Valley of the Tears, about their tears, the Syrian tears, yes. We count uh, 250 tanks just in the area that I was there. Five tanks? Uh, we, we start 40, but we right. lost most of that right. um, during the four days. But after the war, I found um, 250 tanks in, in this particular area. How are you able to take on such a large force? Um, you have to understand the situation. Behind us, nobody was there. And if we uh, lost the battle, they can move on to the Golan Heights and move to the Jordan Valley, and nobody can stop them from capturing Galilee, the north of Israel. And my feeling and my soldiers' feeling was that we are, uh, we are the, the last line that we can protect the country. Um, I had the feeling that I'm, I'm holding the flag of Israel. You know, if, I've, if I'm going to fail this area, nobody can stop them. It, it, it was really terrible. I found myself fight against the T-62, this kind of tank. This is a, 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 almost the same tank. In 25 meters in front of my tank, usually we're fighting two or three kilometer range. And I found it's like uh, to fight with a knife. It's never happened in Israel to fight 25 meters. I found myself in one situation, three Syrian tanks, and their commander looked straight to my eyes, 25 meters. I found myself alone against them. And I hit three of them. And the fourth one tried to hit me, and I hit him too. And um, just because I know how to operate the tank, and my crew work better than the Soviet or the Syrian uh, crew in the tank and this was the system. We knew how to fight better and faster and this is the reason that we are survival. When David took on Goliath and the forces of the Philistines he had I think a feeling that God was behind him. Do you, do you have any kind of a sense that you are uh, uh, overseen in some way by God or some bigger force than yourself that enables you to take on we have to understand that uh, we grew up here, and my parents immigrated from Yemen to here, and everything came from our roots. My root is very deep in this land, in Israel, and uh, 
And all the, I know by heart all the history of Israel. I know the Bible very well. I used to pray in the synagogue every Saturday. And I believe that this kind of feeling that uh, we are the, the new generation of David, uh, this is the feeling that we carry with us. It's, this is really the feeling that we are the generation after 2,000 uh, uh, years, uh, we arrived back to our land and this is the only land that we have. There is no way that somebody push me to this, this, this sea. I'm going to fight here. Well, how do you feel now about giving up the Golan Heights or a portion of it? After having served in the war and uh, your soldiers lost, it, it, doesn't this hurt inside when you see that maybe you're going to have to give up some of that land? Look, I'm a, a political man now. I'm, I'm a member in the parliament, in the Knesset of Israel. I don't, I don't think that I try to give my feeling about the Golan Heights and uh, to make the decision about the future of the Golan Heights from my heart. It has to be a, a, a logic uh, point of view about the system. From my point of view, I I'm, I'm really want peace. I really want peace. And we need peace. And my son is going to be there in the next war if we will fight against the Syrian. But what we need to trust the Syrian that they really want peace like, like us. I know they want back, I know they want back the Golan Heights. I know they said that this is part from Syria. I'm not going to argue with them, but I don't trust them. I believe they don't trust us. And maybe I can trust the president, Assad. What will happen five years from now if his brother is going to take care, take over the country and he doesn't agree about the agreement? He can push the tanks back to the Golan Heights and we will find ourselves thousands of tanks above our head. The different level in this area between the lake of the Galilee is 200 meters below the sea level and the most of the Golan Heights is 1,000 meters above the sea level. To protect north of the Galilee, this is the only way to stay in the Golan Heights. But you think it's possible, let's say, for the Syrians' heart, for the leadership to change and that really to embrace or Look, feel yeah. peaceful towards the Israelis? Until now, until now, they didn't want to talk with us and now they start. Something happened to them. They realized that we are here. They didn't realize until 73 that we are here. They realize now that we are here, and this is the reason that Sadat, the president of uh, uh, Egypt, came to the Knesset of Israel and talked to the nation. And I hope, I pray to the God that Assad, maybe he will do it in the future and come to our Knesset in Jerusalem and try to convince the, the nation that he is ready um, to sign peace treaty with us. Do you think Americans have an accurate picture of what's happening over here? Oh, they can watch TV every day and uh, see somebody throw stone in our soldiers and uh, how our soldiers kill uh, people and uh, Is that what's happening? Is that what's this happening? This is the only, this is most of the people in the United States, I will study there. Most of the people in the United States, that's exactly what they know. People here, people there in the United States, they don't know, they even don't know how difficult it is to, to drive to your house at night. And, uh, and people in the United States, they don't understand. They want quiet, peace, solve the problem. And, but they should know that to solve the problem, we, we don't have another nation. They don't really understand from the, from the beach here, from the, from the sea, until the 67 border is just 15 miles. Can you imagine? People in the, in the United States, they don't understand what we are talking. Go back to 67 border, and that's it. What do you think is the reason that Israel is always cast as the, the David against Goliath? Why are you always having to defend yourself? Such a little country. We arrived to the area in, uh, during the last uh, century. We've decided this is our homeland. 
And we found all the area with a uh, few hundreds, millions Arabs living here. And um, of course, what happened during the Holocaust pushed us to come back. And this is the reason we are trying to put our roots here. And the people around us, they don't like it. And this is the problem. We don't have another country. If somebody forgot, I will send him back to the picture from the Holocaust. You understand what has happened to our nation just because we are Jewish. There are so many places that the Palestinians could go. Why do they have to come here? There's a big Arab world out there. They are talking about a holy land. Every piece of land here, this is holy land for them. And some of our people, they don't understand that it's holy land for us. And they will explain to you how we are uh, so bad people, we push them from the area. And why they are not um, moving their houses to uh, Jordan and Egypt and Syria. I don't know why. Go to Gaza Strip and look how the refugees camp. They are not allowed to destroy their house. And who keep this refugees camp? The, the, the Egyptian, the Jordanian, the Syrian, the Lebanese. They keep the camps just for the reason to try to convince the world against us that we push the refugees. They should know that many of my friends, they are in the cemetery now here. And I lost my brother and my wife, she lost two brothers. In every family in Israel, we have somebody in the cemetery and we are not going to move from here. The only way is to share the area between them and us. There is solution. Believe me, there is solution. They are tired from wars and we are tired from wars. And we can sit together and solve the problem. I'll sing a song with the giants against the mighty foe. I know the Lord is with me wherever I may go. And though the battle's raging, it looks like they will win. I know the Lord is with me even to the end. Search me and know me, Lord, wherever I go. Grant me a clean heart, and will I know how precious are your thoughts? I can't count them all, for you Avigdor's story is wonderful, our, our tank commander friend. When he faced the Syrians, it really was a David versus Goliath uh, battle. The Israelis only had 40 tanks up there to protect Galilee up on the Golan, and the Syrians had 250, but he held his position. Three different tanks shot out from under him, and he held that position and until reinforcements came, and the Syrians never did take Galilee. And uh, now the Israelis have the Golan if they don't just hand it back, and uh, Galilee is protected. The Israelis in general versus the Arabs is David versus Goliath over again. And you've been reading in your newspaper that is Israel is Goliath. Well, that's absurd. Uh, Israel is 1 640th of the land area of the Arabs. Uh, another person put it, if, if the Arabs had twice the holdings of the United States, Israel would be the size of Rhode Island. Uh, it's it's uh, absurdly uh, lopsided. The Israelis are by far the underdog. It's just that CNN and and uh, the New York Times and the others don't want to have it that way. Uh, there are 200 million Arabs, to give you numbers, 4 million Israelis, 200 to 4. 
Egypt has 50 million people, the United Arab Republic. It's more than 10 times the size of Israel's right next to it. But God is taking a side. That's what's happening. Israel is fighting as David did, uh, inspired by the Lord and led by him. And they can defeat Goliath, and they have over and over and over again. And when the Arabs have attacked, as they have repeatedly, they've lost every time and badly. Israel will eventually start to give him the credit. That, well, they are in large part already, but eventually, as prophecy has it, Israel will really return to the Lord, and he will heal their land, as he said. Uh, Avigor doesn't trust uh, Syria, and uh, neither do I. I, I. The only people that trust uh, Syrian dictators or, or Arafat or people like that are, seems to be the American government. Uh, elsewhere, it's laughable, that the idea to make a treaty with people like this. Um, you know, we have a funny government. Right now, we have made monsters out of local dictators that are easier to reach, Castro and Cedrus. Uh, Cuba and Haiti uh, dominate our news. And ne neither country counts for much uh, in terms of uh, American security and so on, where Israel is a democracy in the middle of the tide of Arab dictatorships. It's extremely important. And, uh, and we have a lot of ties to it uh, from this country. But... Um, Castro and Cedrus don't, don't appear to have killed anybody, or maybe they have a few people, but not in a class with Assad who, who bombed Hamas, his own city, 20,000 dead, or, or Arafat, whose legions have blown up uh, uh, the Pan Am 103 and, and the World Trade Center and, and 20, 30 years of, of Arab killing of innocents. Uh, the idea that we make dictators out of these tin horn locals and act friendly and shake hands with Assad, Arafat, and that's not all, the Chinese dictators and so on. One thing decides whether the American government will deal with you. Do you have the cash? Now, our House of David video series is ready. At least part one is ready. This is a long series, 16 programs. So we're going to present eight in part one and eight more in part two. So these will be ready shortly by the time we get your order and have them processed. Uh, all eight will be finished. So you can order the House of David videotape series, $79 for the eight programs. We've gotten it down to less than $10 a program delivered to your mailbox. So I think it's a pretty good deal. Get it at the 800 number with your credit card or, or at the post office box. You can still order, of course, the Faith in the Fire cassette. The music you're hearing on the programs is on the cassette Faith in the Fire, and it's $12. So the uh, videotapes, part one, eight programs, $79, and the music cassette, uh, $12 with the songs. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Raise up a king, we're lost in a world of darkness. Redeem your people, oh, when will he come? I have given.